Hello? Okay. Hi, y'all. My headphones are caught up. Let me put them both in my ears. It doesn't, well, it doesn't really matter. It's just a mic. Um, and, okay, I'm sorry I'm so late. <laughs> it's been very hectic. You know, I'm doing a lot of things by myself at the moment. And I was trying to find the live that I scheduled so that I could, you know, go live from there and it disappeared. I cannot find it in the group. I'm sorry, I'm looking at my computer, but I have my camera plugged in to do the stream. And for whatever reason, I could not see it. And so I was like, what is going on? What is happening? Let me pull up this syllabus though. I might be looking off. It's just gonna have to be off. Oh, let me just put my computer back this way. You know, it's not, oh, do you, I mean, let's be a smart brown girl. <laughs> is it distracting to have the laptop in shot I mean I feel like it is I'm too cute for this uh we're just gonna have to turn this way so let's get into this let me see where the comments are at and see if anyone's on here I am sorry everything has been hectic I have been trying to get all my sound equipment together so that these lives on my end could be a little bit better off um, like when I do the Insta uh, insecure lives on my YouTube channel. So I had to run to the store today and trying to do this interview, series, whatever. Excuses are the tools of the incompetent. So I'm going to leave that alone. But uh, what I am going to do is pull up the syllabus that was drafted by Chloe Jones, who's a member of the syllabi cohort. She did a wonderful job putting together the syllabus for Hood Feminism, which, you know, look at my little, which bookmark do I have in here? Oh, the most popular one. This is the most popular, well, aside from the original one, the beige one, everyone's ordering the original and the beige. Y'all don't like the yellow one? It's okay. It's okay. Um, let's see if I have populated in the group. It's always a little awkward when you start these because it's like, oh, is anybody watching? Can anybody see me? Uh, do they know I'm here? Can you say hello or something? I don't let a bitch know what's good. <laughs> is my wig laid correctly is the question. Hmm. All right. I have all these folders. Products. Syllabi. That's how I did this. Eight. No, we're in May. Bitch, did I not save May to my computer? Oh, no, I did. Here it goes. Oh, hi, Danny. Nice to see you here. Thank you for joining. Okay, I am going to pull up the syllabus. We have it here. It's super big. <laughs> Make this a little bit smaller. Um, and hello, Alana. Look, my Patreon peoples is over here. Hello, Natifa. Hi, I'm so happy to see everyone. I'm sorry it's so delayed. Buy a bookmark. <laughs> I'm looking at them. I have them all right here in my office because I package them all in this space. I'm bent over at the printer trying to print out all the envelopes for this go around. Uh, okay, so let's just go ahead and get into this because there is so much discussion. I'm waiting to see Tanya. She can post a GIF in the comments. I love all her posts. Uh, so just a quick reference about what, if you haven't had an opportunity to purchase the syllabus yet, for one, the January through March syllabus is on sale. Again, the book club is evergreen. So if you are back reading when Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost or Stula, we can re-engage. We can talk about those. As I was saying on my IG live today, Sula had me stressed. So there's always plenty of discussion we can have over Sula or any other books that we've read. And I do want to say the syllabus. So we start off in the syllabus. We have uh, tips for readers. I've been hearing a lot of people about, oh, I'm a slow reader and I'm nervous about joining the book club or nervous about engaging on complex theory tracks. And we are mind very mindful of the complexities of reading. And that's why we provide a community. That's why we have these discussions. And that's why we are very focused on making everything we read super accessible. Okay, so the reading tips are at the beginning of every syllabus, and then we go over the um, overview and motifs. I wonder, can I airdrop this to my iPad so I'm like looking a little bit more like professional when I do this? Is airdrop a thing on the iPad? Oh, it is. Let's see if we can't airdrop this PDF so I'm not looking to the side and not looking at you guys. Things we should have did beforehand. Look, I'm a mess. Oh, the iPad. Oh. When did I put this picture as my profile picture? 
me with blonde hair. Ooh, do I, opening good reader. Okay, if you're looking for a good PDF reader, I love, I don't know if you can really see this, but it's good reader. It's, you have to pay for it, but it lets you read across all your devices. It highlights, it bookmarks, it pulls up notes in the web browser, all that stuff. Okay, so per the syllabus, the discourse objective is that in general, Chloe encourages folks to consider who the author is speaking to. Because our reading of these books is often done so at our own volition, it's often difficult to consider the idea of an intended audience for a book that is being mass produced and widely spread. However, I think an important task, well, Chloe thinks an important task when approaching a new book is, who is the intended audience? As the author is writing this work, who are they thinking of? In the case of Mickey Kendall and Hood Feminism, who are these critiques of a broadly white feminist movement intended for? And to note, there may not be a singular answer. Do you feel as though you are within that identified audience if there is one? And I think that's really good because I, a lot of us in this book club have related very personally to the things that Mickey Kendall is discussing. And I think the overarching theme for as, as far as I've seen it and within the reading that I've done on this book really aligns with the SVG book club because, you know, on all our bookmarks, it's for the black girls in the forgotten spaces. And, you know, on the cover of the book, notes from the women that a movement forgot. So it's a reoccurring theme about the ways in which you know, respectability politics have played into who feminism gets to represent the way white fragility and white womanhood has been weaponized against us. Um, and I think she's critiquing both white, white, the capital F feminist movement that feels very white, and then also sub subtly critiquing the sort of empowerment circle of like wealthy black women that also exists that doesn't, that might in theory and in speech be supportive of you know hood low economic standing what however you want to identify it black women but in praxis they don't really fuck with it, okay and so please comment along please engage we want this to be a collaborative discussion uh where are the people at it's because i'm late i know Okay, so some additional thoughts to consider. How does Kendall's relationship to public discourse and social media, the domains for which she gained much of her notoriety, appear within this book and do you find it useful? How is the author within her targeted critique of mainstream white feminism also model modeling solidarity within this book? And how does she bring in people and ideas from multiple margins of feminism into the fold? Okay, so... Alana is saying, I actually thought about the intended audience a lot. I think it is very validating for black girls and women, but I think this book is for people who, just, who subscribe to mainstream feminism. You know, and I'm listening to the audiobook as well as reading the hard copy. And I, you know, because it's interesting, one of my critiques of eloquent rage, though I would never <laughs> directly say this is Dr. Cooper, was that towards the end of the book, it felt a little redundant in that like the last few chapters were more so for the white women, or I don't, I don't know, because I don't want to claim that Dr. Cooper was writing for white women, but more so maybe like the publisher suggested that we need to make sure that white folk can get this. And I haven't finished her feminism yet, but I do feel like there are certain references where she's making sure that like the white woman gets it. And it's like, mm, you know, so I'm just like, mm -hmm, yeah. But I also feel like she definitely addresses me personally. I wonder if there are any black women who have read this book and felt like they weren't seen or being spoken to. Oh no, you can't see that I'm live? Okay, let's check this. I couldn't see that you started until I hit the link to give you permission for my name, just FYI. Uh, I wouldn't know how to check this because I'm logged in on my personal account. Let's do something spicy. I'm gonna leave a comment. Oh, cause I'm logged in as Julie. Let me see if I leave in. Oh no, I can see it. Oh, 
Oh, but I gave Ecamm permission. Hmm. Oh, no, somebody's commented here that doesn't have. Okay, y'all are stressing me. I'm like, oh, no, can people not see it? Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're trying to be more fluid. All right. So Christina is saying she definitely felt like Mickey was speaking to white women in a lot of ways. And you finished the book all. Are you talking about you're talking about Mickey Kindle, right? Not Eloquent Rage. Um, finished the book all the way. I didn't feel like it was distracting, right? I didn't feel like, you know, I don't. I don't know that did did this overwhelm you know like I don't disagree that it does kind of feel like a plea for I don't know do, do I want to say plea I don't I don't necessarily feel as though she's begging or pleading with white women but I do feel like she's very much so checking them and members of the black community. I just don't feel like she's checking me. Does that make sense? Mm, okay. Let us move on. <laughs> I'm like now worried that other people can't see that I'm live. Dag. I have no way of checking this though. Uh, hmm. Okay, I'm going to skip the intro because y'all can always. Okay. Go over the intro yourself, but let's go into chapter one, which is solidarity is still for white women. Um, so Kendall identifies the exclusion of trans women within mainstream popular feminism. However, the hashtag solidarity is for white women does not explicitly suggest a critique of the idea of women itself, i.e. that cis white women are often assumed to be the only women. Are white trans women also implicated within the critique of white solidarity? Ooh, that's a real sturdy question, Chloe. That, that was real start. That's a real interesting way to top off. Because when I went through this chapter, I don't even know that I paid a lot of attention to what she was talking about with the hashtag of solidarity is for white women. Uh, I kind of had to go back through my little notes here. Like, where did I? I got through a good bit and it said, solidarity is not for everyone. It cannot realistically include everyone. So the, perhaps the answer is to st establish common goals and work in partnerships. And I highlighted that portion, which is on chapter eight of the first, on page eight of the first chapter, because I enjoyed that she acknowledged that everything doesn't have to last for forever. And that sometimes I think when we, re when we read these critiques, or maybe this is an output of like the age of social media, where we are critiquing things. We tend to critique things at like such a high level and say that you have to like meet me here 100%. And again, when you put things into praxis, are they really livable? Are they sustainable? And people are going to falter. And so what do you do? Are you canceling everyone as soon as they falter? Or are there ways in which we can acknowledge that, you know, especially if we're, so we're creating solidarity across identities, and that we're not always going to see eye to eye on everything, do we not give room for the fact that sometimes solidarity happens for a season, solidarity can evolve, and that there is no way in the current system, especially in the system that we do not control, to be able to stand for everyone and everything. Hmm. Uh, somebody's asking, will this be... Oh, now the names are popping up. Will this be saved? Yes. All the lives are always saved in the Facebook group. This is not my Instagram. This is not my personal Instagram. This is the book club. So we save the lives. I'm a little worried that people really can't see this unless they give their name over. Because now I see everyone's name. I don't see anyone. Oh, uh, no. I'm a little worried. Okay. Uh <clears throat> 
that was what really stood out to me um, in this chapter. But I do appreciate the question that uh, Chloe is asking because, right, you're critiquing the hashtag, but then she is she really giving any substantiated critique about what does the definition how the definition of woman should be is it right to say expanded or should be inclusive because she does mention that you can be a woman without a uterus and I think that's kind of how she drafts it up but she also is acknowledging for me in that passage about solidarity that she isn't explicitly going to have the absolute answer or the panacea for how we should move forward and coalesce together in solidarity so I said, I don't, I didn't know how I felt about the ending of the chapter, pivoting to how a white woman singularly helped her and making her the highlight. I didn't know how I felt about her, like personally shouting out one particular white woman. Um, but I agree with the overall theme of the chapter, distinguishing the case for women of color, not being intentionally included in capital F feminism. Uh... You know, and part of why Chloe was critiquing, well, ask that question in critique of the hashtag solidarity is for white women is because Mickey Kendall created that hashtag in 2013. So how might hashtags and the use of social media in general complicate or improve our ability to produce nuanced conversations online? And I think that question is asking you to kind of think through the critique of, oh, well, we can't just hashtag our way out of things because that is too flat of a criticism, right? Is it not that, well, hashtag activism shouldn't be the only form of activism and that we can build upon the sort of awareness and viral ability that a hashtag brings about and then motivate people from that versus criticize people about that? Hmm. That's where I land. I would love to hear your thoughts. Kendall, I, I kind of want to text somebody to like see if. That's where. I, okay. Because I'm just worried nobody can see. But then I feel like all the administrators will be able to see. Let me text Whitney. Um, Kendall's address of white mainstream feminism issues around solidarity starts with her discussion of the hashtag solidarity is for white women. She identifies several instances with social media history, including Lena Dunham and Amy Schumer at the Met Gala to launch her critiques. However, beyond the domain of social media, how do we propose a more ooh, capacious <laughs> under, I, I, prom I edited this syllabus. I promise you, I read the whole thing. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're such an academic capacious understanding of feminism within our communities and organizational work within our day-to-day -day interactions with white women. So how do we propose a more capacious understanding of feminism within our communities and organizational work within our day-to-day -day interactions with white feminism? So what Chloe in the syllabus is asking is for us to think through, well, we take this critique, right? And if we find this critique valid, what actions would we want to see come out of our critique? You know, what restorative processes would we like to be included? Because we can critique Lena Dunham and Amy Schumer for, you know, making a false accusation against Odell Beckham because he didn't pay them any attention at the Met Gala. But is it just, oh, what, well, okay, we don't do that anymore. And then we constantly have to go through each action you don't do. Or is there a more productive, at, at minimum, dialogue to be had that moves this hashtag into a productive mode of action? Right. So as Danae says, hashtag activism should be seen as a a first step, the, not the only step in raising awareness and pushing for change. And what I want to say, though, is I don't care for the critique that, oh, well, I'm going to uh, sideline or talk down to or criticize Mickey Kendall 
for creating the hashtag. No, I think what would be more productive is to thank her and then say, okay, well, let me help facilitate the next steps of this process. And so what Chloe in the syllabus is asking all of us collectively to do is to think about, okay, well, we have this hashtag. We understand the point she's making. We agree with the criticism she's launching. What, how would we as a community like to see this progress into action where our labor isn't constantly required to keep white women in check? Why did you think the examples of Lena and Odell were a little out of place in this chapter? I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Do I feel like the author approached things like the hashtag culture of highlighting issues or do you feel like she sometimes provided a what to do next process? I, for the most part, feel like what I've read thus far in this book, and I believe, what chapter am I up to? Girl. I have read, in the book, I've read up to, ooh, Only Hunger? <laughs> I have the audiobook. I've listened up through How to Write, a Black, How to Write About Black Women on the audiobook. And uh, I think for the most part, she's providing a criticism and not so much a plan of action. And I don't mind that. I don't necessarily find that to be a negative of the book because then the book, does the book become, I want to say didactic, but that's self-taught. Does the book become too authoritative? Does it then position itself as an end-all, be-all, as a know-it-all? And rather, what I do appreciate is because if you're going to talk about the black women who the movement forgot, and you're not saying that, and I don't think the theme is that all black women were forgot by this movement, because some black women have profited from this movement, and particular to the space that Nikki cultivates on Twitter, she is largely surrounded by quite a few black women who've made a business out of this, even though they're their lived politics aren't inclusive of all black women. And so she also has to acknowledge her own privilege and access that she has. And she can't really write an answer or what is the plan of action for everybody, right? Uh, that is, you're more so creating a platform of community dialogue where we can all come together and say, okay, I never thought about it this way. Now let me think about this differently and come together with what I would like to see on the on the other end. Oh, I think there's just a delay with my comments coming through. You know, I, I meant to plug in. <laughs> I be look, I have a whole Ethernet cord, but it's on the floor <laughs> and I'm on my Wi-Fi. I'd be a mess. One of these days we're gonna get it together. Intersectionality isn't, I'll say on page 11, the quote is intersectionality isn't a convenient bud, buzzword that can be co-opted into erasing Professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who coined the term to describe the way race and gender impact black women in the justice system. Um, and then within the syllabus, uh, Chloe links to the article, the journal entry, um, that Dr. Crenshaw composed and where she first uses the term intersectionality. Demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex, a black feminist critique of anti-discrimination doctrine, feminist theory, and anti-race politics. That's the name of the article. Uh, so that's where Crenshaw uses the term intersectionality. Have you seen intersectionality used or misused before? And what are the ramifications, if any, of the misuse or co-opting of the term slash theory of intersectionality and what do you think intersectionality has gained why do you think intersectionality has gained so much traction outside of its original context all right so while y'all think about that question in particular i would love to discuss why we think intersectionality has gained so much traction and what are the ramifications of its misuse but alana is filling us in on why she believes that the example of lena and odell were a little out of place because the chapter starts off talking about how respectability limits to access to feminism and i thought she would continue along that line of reasoning hmm. i mean i think i thought i didn't really think too much of the example because i was familiar with it and it just felt like she's making it relatable Right. Like this isn't an academic book. This isn't something that's meant to have all these like 
super refined, you know, long syntax set sentences that uh, dig really deeply into all these things. I think you want to pull out the pop culture references that both sides of Twitter, <laughs> the black Twitter and the non-black Twitter, can reference and be like, oh, okay. So I don't know. I didn't think it was too out of place, but I wasn't also invested in the example. A friend of mine works for a millennial civil rights movement and they struggle for involvement and always trying to find out why people won't get involved. I'm convinced it's because historically our civil rights leader were put on a pedestal and as a result, regular people have a hard time seeing themselves in this light as a member of a, the movement. And then there's fear in reference to a lack of movement and beyond hashtags. You know, I think part of what also happens is there was a historical, like, within the history of the civil rights movement, the beginning, okay, so when you talk about civil rights, right, I think a lot of us think of like the 1960s and MLK and Malcolm X, but the civil rights movement started in the 1910s, right? And we have like this, you know, you have the Booker T. Washingtons and the W.E.B. Du Bois, but at the, the, the real gathering of organizing around civil rights came from, you know, low income and working class black folks, like poor black people, right? And the struggle was for labor and economics. There was the code of 1864. And I'm, I'm like not getting all the terms right. I'd have to, the book is literally out in my hallway where there's a constitutional law that's part of the 13th Amendment that says you cannot force a person to work. And black folks were consistently petitioning the federal government to say, well, not only can we not force you to work, but that we are ensuring your right to paid work, to paid labor. Because what happened is, okay, we're not going to force you to work, but then, you know, all your options were to either work in somebody's home, doing their laundry, taking care of their kids, or sharecropping. And, you know, that's a half a step above slavery. And so you see this sort of organizing and movements around labor laws and economic access. And then we, we get into the right to quality education because it's, we're told that education is the route to better jobs. And then when that educational push starts to take over and then we have the, the MLK version of civil rights start to take over, there's a switch from the you know, working class, sharecropper, black activist to the college student. We also see this replicated in the black church, right? The black Baptist church. When it first started out, you had, again, sharecropper, local black pastors. And then there's an ascension of that a pastor, in order to be able to man a large church, had to be college educated. And part of that was because a lot of the HBCUs opened up via the basements of Baptist churches. So, you know, there's all these things kind of running together. And I think the, since the civil rights movement, you know, like we, we started again talking about like Fannie Lou Hamer, but I don't think we've ever really gotten back to this idea that working class people and letting go of all the respectability around who we will activate, you know, be activists around, we haven't let, we have not let go of that. And folks aren't going to get involved with things if they don't have a shiny veneer. I think also a lot of folks don't necessarily want to, uh, haven't been pressed to uh, sacrifice themselves for anything. Especially if you can seem woke or like an activist via the internet, there really isn't a lot of incentives to, to invest in the labor it takes to actually be an activist. I wonder if she thinks that a plan of action is for mainstream white feminists to figure out instead of black feminists constantly having to teach. And I agree that she may be giving more information for us to have a dialogue and have autonomy and creativity to create a plan of action. You know what, Neon? I, first of all, I like that name. That is, if I hope oh, I said it correctly, that is a really good point though, right? Like, is it, for, is it for a black woman to define the plan of action or is it not, this book not saying, hey, white woman, you need to figure some shit out. And I think why so many of us like it is because she's not telling us what we need to do. She is saying to them, figure it out. Get your shit together.
I think because there's such a huge critique of feminism and there is a lot of white women who want to be seen as inclusive, they co-opted the term as a way to say, hey, we believe in diversity still too, but they still don't want to cons- to center those who are most vulnerable. And this is in regards to the term of intersectionality. Yes. I often see intersectionality as being used to reference multiple identities, but Crenshaw is also talking about how those identities shape our relationships to systems of privilege and oppression. I do think that uh, the, the, the term, hold on. I do think the term is being overused by people. And I mean, I think this is what happens with the advent of social media and everyone having a platform and everyone wanting to sound super intellectual and educated, but like everyone not having access to these academic spaces where this sort of language is coming out of, right? Like how many people not only have the access and the means to read Dr. Crenshaw's work, but also have the dialogical education required to really grasp on to the the language. Uh, I think on my side of the internet, it does often feel like when people are throwing jabs at intersectionality or identity politics, that they are misusing the word. I, I literally, I have, the video will probably be up tomorrow or Saturday. I was doing a video for Audible about outrage and how it's become profitable. And I was like looking through all this PewDiePie stuff and it really has become, well, not that's not where I want to go. PewDiePie did a video talking and he made the comment about intersectionality. Do I not have any intersectionality? That's why you don't like me. And I'm like, the fuck? Like who, what? Uh... And so it's become, you know, sometimes when the term becomes overused, but people don't have the means or access to really understand the language, it does a disservice for the constant use to keep coming up without the dialogical education being broadened. Movement building has large, been largely started around the individual, and this has just been exasperated in the age of late capitalism. Yeah, I mean, well, because... And it's the way it's a it's also the way outrage works, right? A lot of people are getting their news from headlines. And so it's much easier to be able to say, all right, I'm going to create a movement around a Trayvon Martin versus saying, okay, the cops are too violent in our communities. Because a lot of black folks will still say, well, don't get in trouble. Don't bother the police and you know even with the the advent of black lives matter around trayvon martin you still had black folks educating their children to to follow certain rules so that they wouldn't get shot by the cops and it's taken a while for us to really come around to the idea that there is nothing that we can educate our way out of if the white folks ain't fitting to change. If the systems and structures that surround us aren't fitting to change, we can't educate ourselves out of this pathos. Uh, And so I think we're starting to get there, but I don't necessarily think it's bad. I mean, I personally don't really invest a whole lot in critiquing the fact that movements center individuals or individual stories, because unless I'm gonna go out and organize myself, I'll be trying to be careful about my my critiques. And what I do do instead is look to support organizations like um, the Bail Out Black Mom Fund, uh, the Voices of Women organization in Louisiana. I did that bail reform video, and there's a bunch of organizations that I featured that were doing on the ground work around communal work. It's ironic, or shall we say interesting, that this is the start of the civil rights by poor Blacks, but now it's a movement that can feel only for people with certain access. And I mean, I also think that Mickey Kendall makes that point within the first couple of chapters of the book, that these movements, Black feminism, was about like queer women, 
poor black women. Um, and it was about all these intersections of identity that were supposed to be included in woman, therefore feminism. And somehow capitalism still has its reins on everything. And in order to make it marketable, we have to make it inaccessible. Because <laughs> we are marketing towards white women. All right, let's move on to chapter two, gun violence. I think we're just going to go through to... That's not halfway through the book. I'm trying to say how far do I want to go because I'm already 35 minutes in. All right. Oh, this is a long book. <laughs> We're only going to go up to It's Raining Patriarchy today. <laughs> we'll have to do like five more before we get Mickey Kendall in here. Also, please read your newsletter because there is a link. I'm going to post it in the Facebook group sometime next week, but there's a link to submit your questions for Mickey Kindle. And again, we curate all the questions before. Um, we don't really end up taking too many live questions in the um, author chat. It just makes it easier to run and more sleek and everyone kind of, we can format the pattern we go in. So please submit your questions ahead of time. All right, so let's get into gun violence. So did you grow up around guns? And did any of the experiences and anxiety Kendall identifies as part of growing up around guns resonate with you? So if we look at page 15 through 17 and then 21, why is gun violence, according to Kendall, an appropriately feminist issue? And why is gun violence not just a hood concern? Do you agree with Kendall's assessment of guns? To me, guns are tools. The people wielding them are, dis are the deciding factor in whether the tool is used safely or unsafely. Ooh, this was a little, this was, a, this was an interesting chapter for me because my views on uh, guns uh, were very, it's complicated because it's evolving. I have for very long been very anti-gun ownership altogether. And I did put a question mark because the, the quote um, at the beginning, to me, guns are tools. The people wielding them are the deciding factor and whether that tool is used safely or unsafely. And that is on page 15. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. Y'all not, you asking questions that I could tell y'all not reading that newsletter. Where we put the date of when Mickey Kendall will be joining the chat. Um, yeah. I, I, I think in these times, in this climate, that I no longer feel comfortable pushing, pushing the message that absolutely nobody should own a gun. And I do think we are headed towards some sort of violence <laughs> and should we not be protected, right? Like these white people are crazy. I, I, I need to log off Twitter and stop seeing these, these clips of white women in the store yelling at folks. Um, and then I watched that video of the young black woman in Chicago getting run over by a Grubhub driver. I just don't think it's fair to now say that I'm going to, uh, that I, not even that I don't think it's fair. I no longer want to make choices in my life where because someone else owns a gun and I do not, I'm moving in a mode of defense that I wouldn't have to if I was a gun owner. I don't necessarily want to promote the idea that we should all buy guns, but um, <laughs> I might be in the process. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in the, Christina is saying she grew up in the West Louisville, Kentucky, specifically the Shawnee neighborhood, which is considered the hood because it's primarily black. There's a lot of shootings that happen and I have lost class to gun violence. My relationship with guns is very complicated and I understand what the use of protection, but also once you've lost people, phew. You know, and I think what I do appreciate as I got further into this chapter was that She's not necessarily flatly advocating for the fact that black folks should invest in their Second Amendment right. 
she's connecting guns, as we've, we've heard time and again, to a public health issue, to a systematic structural issue, to that we can't just say, all right, well, these communities, these hood communities shouldn't have guns, right? Because the way our gun laws pretty much work in this country, really, gun laws are for black folk. They really not, we, ha- we don't really have gun laws for the white folk. And we're not really looking at the issues that cause the increase in gun violence, right? Like it's, it's, it's intellectually dishonest to bring up the statistics of gun violence in Chicago and not look at the states that are surrounded by their, that they, uh, the cities and states that they are surrounded by that have weaker gun laws, that the way gun transportation works, what are the options for the people in these neighborhoods? What else is happening that's leading people towards, you know, seeking out gun ownership and the sort of activities that lead towards the violence versus just claiming that gun laws won't do anything because Chicago has some of the strict gun laws and still has a high rate of gun violence. And I feel like Kendall does a good job of, of walking through that. I agree with Mickey Kendall's point of view on guns as a tool. I do strongly believe there needs to be stronger, stricter regulations, policies around who should have access to guns. I absolutely, I absolutely think, you know, we should at least at minimum have like better machine gun laws. Violence is most likely to proliferate where there is no other source of recourse for solving disputes. And that is why we see an increasing rate of gun violence in rural areas as well as higher death rates, even as gun violence declines in urban rare areas, though it's not a fact commonly cited in the news. Oh, I was reading something today in ProPublica about like the up, how one way you can look at where there is poor healthcare options is the rate of amputations. And they were pointing that in the Mississippi Delta area, there the Delta region has some of the highest rate of amputations in the country. And when you get something amputated, one, if the, when there's a high rate of them, that means that the doctors aren't properly investing in preventive care. They're not properly taking care of the patient when they come in. They're just saying, oh, we'll just cut off the limb. And then that means a lesser quality of life for the people who become amputees. Because once you stop walking and you start being mobile, your body starts to break down from being so sedentary. Right. So it's like how all these in the ProPublica piece was talking about how all these other things complicated. It's not just that doctors need to take better care of their patients. And so black folks need to be treated better when they enter the hospital. It is also that there are all these laws surrounding how doctors pay off student loans. So there's not really an investment for doctors to get into the store, the area that would over that would hand, like become a cardiologist or whatever kind of doctor it is that looks at um, amputations and blood clots and stuff. And then you have the way healthcare laws are written and like just all oh, there's like so many pieces and I'm like, dad, you know, it's this is very similar to like gun violence, right? And that's why it should be seen as a public health issue because there are all these other things connecting to why you know, violence, even like as Mickey's stating in this piece about like there's a higher death rate around this because, you know, there's less quality of health care, lesser quality health care. Girl, where your cousin live at? I'm going I'm to put post a ProPublica piece in the comments later after this. I'm going to tweet it. That's what I'll, do. I'll tweet it because it was a really, really good read. And I was like, yo, I personally don't have any of my family that's been an amputee. But I know that, like, they were talking about the connection to diabetes and diabetes type 2 specifically, which is highly prevalent in the black community. And, you know, all these other things impact why someone is getting an amputation and not really the necessity of them needing to have it amputated. It was startling. I thought maybe her point wasn't about just guns, but whose violence is prioritized, whose violence is reported, and what the implications of the way the media and cultural thought imagines gun violence is or are. Yeah, I I do think her overarching part point was that we can't just talk about uh, 
gun violence in the hood and not talk about that gun violence is also just high in poor, poor neighborhoods and rural neighborhoods in various settings. Poverty limits access to the power and sense of safety that comes with being one of the property owners who our current policing system is designed to protect. And I thought this quote, which is at the top of page 19, it's it, this connects back to like the ingrained white supremacy. So when we talk about white supremacy that's ingrained into the United States culture, into our public policy and our laws, is you go back to some of the early laws that were written around white men who owned property. And all these like marriage was created for white men who own property. Most of our early laws protected white men who own property. And we, we haven't really evolved that much past that theory because we are still a white supremacist society. And now it's just, well, white people who own homes. And so you go into these poor neighborhoods, people don't even own their own property. They don't, you know, they don't, and so they're, therefore, you know, the police don't deem them worthy of protection, especially if you go into areas where you don't have good tenant laws. We focus on page 21. We focus anti-gun violence programs on everyone but the girls and women at risk. Too often we frame them as the ones who bear witness to the consequences and not the ones who face them. Yes, and I do believe her to her point that gun violence is a feminist issue partly because she's countering the way that feminism has used the discussion around gun violence to project harmful stereotypes against the African-American community and to, you know, create laws that focus on this theory of like the victim protection and make it difficult for people to fight for their rights or their innocence if they are ever wrongfully convicted of anything. And it becomes hostile for black folks to even own a gun, but not hostile for the whites. Why might Kendall include the seemingly tangential issues such as over-policing and domestic abuse as part of her discussion of gun violence? Because within the chapter on the gun violence, Kendall speaks frequently about domestic partner violence and what do you make of this connection? Is domestic partner violence a symptom or a residual of gun violence? Dak, I don't know the reference. What did Naomi Walder and her speech at the March for Lives rally discuss? You would have to fill me in. Okay, let's move in to chapter three. Uh, yeah, she does. She has a whole section about the inaccessibility of where she grew up at in Chicago and how gentrification doesn't make it any more accessible to people that live there, but just pushes them out. She very, yeah, there's a, there's a chapter. Yes. Thank y'all. There's a chapter on housing. She kind of goes through all the particulars. So I would highly, highly, highly recommend that everybody gets either the hard copy of the book or the audio book. <laughs> Cause it might take a minute for the hard copy to come in before we do her talk on June 10th. Okay, so hunger. We know in the abstract that poverty is a feminist issue. Indeed, we think of it as a feminist issue for other countries. And I thought this quote was so exact. We know in the abstract that poverty is a feminist issue. Indeed, we think of it as a feminist issue for other countries. And that we are in a place where bootstraps and grit can be enough to get anyone who wants it bad enough out of poverty. Ooh, that's a typo. My bad. That's my fault. Hmm. 
Kendall defines food deserts. Um, and I think this was a very enlightening chapter for a lot of folks who maybe haven't thought about housing, well, no, not housing, but food and access to food as a feminist issue. But Kendall defines food deserts as areas where groceries are scarce and what is available may be unfit for human consumption. This is on page 33. How does Kendall complicate our understanding of safety nets for food insecurity? How might safety nets intervene or neglect the the cyclical nature of poverty and food insecurity? What are our current systems for aid insufficient? Why are our current systems for aid insufficient, according to Kendall? And why does Kendall include programs and policies targeted at obesity within her discussion of food insecurity? What is the relationship between the two? Oh, okay. This is good to know. I'll definitely have to come back to this link and watch it for later. Um, Because I do think Kendall is right to make the argument that we so often frame gun violence as an issue of like men and men owning guns and black men being violent and black men needing the guns taken away from them. And we don't necessarily consider the way that particular to the lives of black women, we have a we have a precarious experience around guns and gun violence. Mm. But uh, I I thought the commentary that Kendall made in the hunger chapter around food deserts was very present, right? Uh, I don't know that people tend to think, oh, food stamps are just ghetto and free money. And we don't realize that food stamps and all these all these various aid programs were created under the Social Security Act of 1934. And initially, Black women were left out of the ability to procure that aid. And then once we were allowed to get something like food stamps or aid for dependent children, that the laws continually over the past, 70, 80 years have gotten progressively, and it's kind of like a double entendre, progressively draconian to the point where we've now instilled work regulations and work requirements that almost make it impossible for a lot of people who definitely qualify for food stamps to get food stamps. And there's been an ongoing, you know, narrative around them to dissuade people from using any the sort of minimum safety nets that are accessible to them, right? Like we've made this idea that Section 8 housing, that food stamps, that, um, you know, even the way we're talking about unemployment right now, that these ideas are so ghetto and like what what's wrong with your life if you have to rely on them. But these are the same sort of, all the legislation that governs those type of programs is the same legislation that created pensions, <laughs> which we largely very positively talk about, right? Um, and Black folks up and through through the 80s were left out of jobs that would qualify them for pensions unless you would get you a good government job and or work at the post office. Yeah. Uh, I did think uh, her discussion around the, the soda tax was interesting. And as Alana is suggesting, yeah, I didn't, I pre- previously to reading it, hadn't really thought too much or, about how the soda tax might really just be more harmful to low income, not even just black folks, but low income folks in general, right? Especially if we're, we're levying tax on what's accessible to them, but not providing better quality food in the same price range, right? So we're going to say oh, we're going we're gonna to tax soda that, so that it becomes inaccessible, but we're not providing a grocery store in your neighborhood, right? We're not giving you the filter so you can get cleaner water. We're not making fresh produce financially accessible to you or just physically accessible to you. We're just going to levy a tax. And it's like, what what problem do you actually, you don't solve the problem. You just further inconvenience the people that are already harmed by the structure of their community. A 
a very good point. Even though, you know, black folks, the black veterans, and I think the GI Bill really convinced of more black folks to at least enter the reserves and go ahead and get them a piece of them benefits. <laughs> but yeah, all these same laws, like they're all social services. And we, we think that like white folks are qualified for them. But as soon as black folks or people of color in general get a hold of them, we suddenly are like, no, they're ghetto. You're leeching off the government. You're lazy. You're not working. She made a great argument for obesity, weight loss programs, and a system of oppression, and even the ways to access food stamps. Mm. I thought this this chapter was just thorough through and through. There wasn't really anything that I disagreed with that she positioned in this chapter around food. And it really made me think even more broadly about the ways in which a lack of access to a grocery store. And if you only have a, what's considered a corner store or bodega within your neighborhood. And then, you know, how is this also doubled by that? A lot of black folks live in the Southern United States don't live in any proximity to public transportation. And again, something that we, again, you know, create this negative narrative around, like who wants to take the bus? You know, I was in Norway with my homegirl and everybody take the bus and it was delightful. It was great. And it made it really accessible to get from her house in what was in the countryside to the grocery store, then to the train station to go into um, the center of Oslo. And no one was turning their nose up at it. No one was suggesting that using a government resource was negative. As a matter of fact, it was seen as a respectful thing to do and as a way in which life was made comfortable for everyone. And it has a great trickle down effect. So, you know, we, we say, oh, how dare you get food stamps? How dare you take the bus to the grocery store? You know, I had to check myself one time because I was in an Uber pool and a dude got in with all his grocery bags in the Uber pool. And I'm like, you know what? He going to catch his $5 Uber ride to Southeast DC. I'm not, I'm not even mad at it. I'm not even mad. I have enough coin to assuage my pride and catch an, oh, a solo Uber because I used to take Uber to the grocery store. But I, you know, oh man, man, when I was in Dallas and I didn't have a car, I would use all sorts of means to get to the grocery store that I wanted to go to. So I love, I love H-E-B and H-E-B's response to like a, a Sprouts and a Whole Foods. So like kind of in between price point was um it's not world market it's central market and central market in dallas is off the train and so there was a free bus because i lived in downtown dallas there was a free bus that literally went from the door of my apartment complex to the train station which was a like three quarters of a mile up the road and i would take that to get on the train and then you know go do my grocery shopping and then come home when i had that whole fallout with chrissy the imaginary beef that she created Somebody left a comment, Julesy is a bum bitch because I used to see her in downtown Dallas waiting for the bus. The fuck you did? Yes, you did? I'm helping the ecosystem. Minimizing gas emissions. Like, I don't, like, what, like what's wrong with taking the bus? And I remember seeing that comment and being like, how, how is it a slight that I utilize the public transportation that's available to me? Like what, like, how does that assign a like struggle or less than qualities about myself? I don't get it. Y'all is crazy. The something, the same thing happens in gentrified areas. Bike lanes pop up and public transportation is suddenly available and an environmentally better choice. But then God forbid poor people in low income area, income areas get those public. And I mean, oh, I'm in Charlotte. We got, we got bike lanes. We get a, we get a train system all the way up Central Avenue right over here. And I was like, you know, you go to West Baltimore. I'm not West Baltimore. West Baltimore is a hood. You go to West Charlotte. <laughs> You go to West Charlotte and the train doesn't go over there, right? Well, they're trying to gentrify West Charlotte because it's up, it's right outside of Uptown. And so they want, they're putting the train on West Trade, but they don't go further up like BD Fords or past, what is that, Johnson C. Smith. 
there's no bike trails over there. There's a, there's a few parks in that area too. So like, why wouldn't you put bike trails? Why wouldn't you put a bike trail at least to make it easier for people to get to the train? But where the white folks is at, you know, as soon as they clear out all the black folks and raise the, the housing prices, they suddenly can put in the public transportation that the wealthy people don't really use anyway. And they purposely keep it out the hood because they don't want the hood to be able to come into their neighborhoods easier. Girl, public transportation don't hit in the South. We ain't got no trains, no buses. It's the ghetto. And I'm like, Dad, you, you think about how much more accessible things. Like, I love the fact that the train in Dallas will go from downtown all the way to the airport. And I didn't necessarily find the train more convenient than having a car, but it made it less of a burden to not have a vehicle. And obviously, you know, it still does, didn't necessarily go to like, and I mean, no, I will give the credit. The train in Dallas does go to South Dallas, even though it's a little bit more complicated to like get where you need to go, but it, it's opening it up to someone. And I just wish the Southern United States, like if you're not going to have like a local train system, can we get a national train system at least? Like golly, like that would make life better for everybody. I don't know why y'all white folk is just hating. Y'all having a whole fit over these bike lanes. I, I be riding my little bike in the bike lane though. I like me a bike lane. <laughs> this chapter was really great. I, I think we all learned a lot in the hunger chapter. Okay. Oh, uh, where is Tanya? We about to discuss fast tales, girls and freedom. Okay. Where's she at? I'm sorry. I was late. I done lost all the folk. Everybody done left the live. Y'all not keying with me no more. Let's wrap this up. We got two more chapters to go. Okay. A uh, fast tale, girls and freedom. Everybody done left a post in the Facebook group. I love all y'all posts. Thank y'all. Y'all engagement is wonderful. Just read, just read the newsletter for me, please. I pay a lot of money to send them hoes out. Only 30% of y'all opened that bitch yesterday. Did I send it out too late? Uh, <laughs> you know what? Oregon is a racist ass state though. Wasn't it created as a white utopia? So y'all would have a bomb ass train station. And isn't Nike in Portland? No. Yeah, Nike's in Portland. That's why y'all got a bomb ass train system. I'm surprised that like, you know, Atlanta only got a train system because of the Olympics. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And where the train go? Where does the train go? Ugh. Ugh. I I would I love a good train. I miss taking the Amtrak. Call me up when we like we have enough highway they could build train above the highway. Call me up when they do it. I don't care if I'm 50 when that shit finally open. Just make it happen in my lifetime. Okay. Did you hear the term fast-tailed girls when growing up? And in what reference did you hear it? Because I am a black girl from the 90s and I heard that ish fall too much. A whole lot. It is a lot. How does Kendall relate respectability politics and sexual abuse within her discussion of fast-tailed girls? And what are some of the emotional or psychological consequences of internalizing labels such as fast tail girls? How might that term affect young black boys too? Kendall notes that crimes of sexual violence against black women and women of color broadly, largely go unpunished and that many women have taken up that charge for, for reparations for victims. What does justice for victims of violence look like today what do you think justice should look like and what do you think justice for sexual assault victims can look like given the constraints of our society it's time it's easy to blame the patriarchy to rightfully point at the men who rape and hold them accountable what's harder is to notice the women who sometimes passively direct rapists toward their victims by contributing to the hypersexualization of women of color under the guise of empowerment. And if that wasn't a read, girl, 
I, I this is a chapter I listened to on the audiobook and when she said I was like, Oh man, whose card are you pulling? Who are you coming for? It's not my neck. But it was definitely some bitches in the Kingdom Hall. I ain't grew up in the church. I grew up in the Kingdom Hall. It was definitely some folks that sat in the front row of the Kingdom Hall <clears throat> that I would like to tap on the shoulder and give them this chapter to read. And it is true. Like, we can say, all right, you know, it is a much more complicated conversation to say who who empowered R. Kelly, who protected R. Kelly. And what ways were these girls led to someone like that? And how in the discourse that we even have about these young women, do we not give them the pathway of recovery, but yet we further um, disarm them, we further castigate them as pariahs, right? Or fast tail girls who deserved it. Oh, this sound like me. I'm listening to this stuff while I'm on my bike. I'm like, oh girl, Ooh. how I bookmark this? <laughs> hey Siri, bookmark that. When she talked about programs for at-risk girls that tend to focus on job skills and preventing pregnancy, but ignore the PTSD, depression, and anxiety, and substance abuse they may have to sit with and think that was deep for me. Girl, it was, I mean, it was like, yeah, growing up, we had job core. We had all these things about don't get pregnant, you know, go to college. But like, no one was talking about the, the ways in which you know, I think she makes a reference to like the old uncle or how older men may approach us. The way that like I, you know, I have full lips. I have big lips, right? So like I hit 14 and all of a sudden there was all these comments from all types of men about my lips. And I'm like, I'm a teenager. Like, what are y'all doing? Why are y'all talking to me like this? And then you you invest in this belief. That if, and she talks a lot about this, okay, well, I need to be ladylike. I need to quiet myself. I need to hide myself. I need to present myself as an acceptable young black girl. And, you know, Dr. Cooper discusses this in Eloquent Rage, right? How some of us cling to this idea of being the exceptional one. Because that's who the community will uplift. But what harm is that really doing to the broader community of young black girls? Who we are being upheld over. You know, fast tail girl is often used, as you're saying, Mian, in, in contrast to someone taking on some idle rule of dress or manner in order to not be deemed fast. Ooh, and I mean, no one talking about the hood niggas. I can't see your name because um, you can, but talking about the hood niggas cat calling you and verbally and physically violent towards you. And it ain't even just hood niggas or poor black men. You know, you might just, the way in which you might have teachers refer to you, the way in which you start to realize that your blackness is a problem. And that particularly you being a black woman offers even less protections from all sorts of people. And that you are really out on your own. It is crazy. This chapter really resonated for me as a young child of the 90s. And, you know, like, I, you know, I used to hear all the time about uh, Freak Nick. <laughs> and, like, these, you know, Bike Weekend and Memorial Day Weekend and all these kind of, like, you know, where black college student or college age folk would get out and just have a good time. And it's like, don't ever be like that. You know, these girls. And then, you know. Oh man, this is also the age like tip drill and BET late night and all these sexually explo ex exploitative sort of videos where, well, if they're a video model and they want to be treated like that, who are we to say anything about it? Where it was constantly suggested that black women w were the held the power in how they were treated. And n never, it, like until uh, my late 20s, I never heard the concept of a community collectively gathering to protect black women and like black women as a whole. And I constantly grew up hearing this message of, you know, you have to dress a certain way. 
You have to speak a certain way. You need to be educated. You need to not get pregnant. And it's totally on you to not get pregnant. And, you know, if you dare have an ass and hips, you know, it's your your duty to hide them so that no gaze may land on them. There was so much responsibility put on our shoulders and so little support. Ugh. I mean, so you're, this is pulling from Eloquent Rage, but Mickey Kendall also discusses this in the book about how this culture creates pick me's, right? And this, but like, who's, we, we're all losing. You know, you might, a, a handful of us might have the privilege of, you know, sanding ourselves down to fit a very binary understanding of respectable black woman and even, you know, find some success in becoming a pygmy. But is that success forever? Is, you know, does that give you ease of life through propertuity? Or are there not times where it also fails you as well? And really for the broader audience, broader community, these things aren't very accessible. Mm, okay let's move into it's rating patriarchy but we can still talk about fast tale girls and freedom because i think these chap these two chapters are very connected and this is where we're going to end and we'll just schedule something for next week we'll get somebody from the cohort to come in and talk about you know the next five chapters so that we can be all caught up by time mickey gets in here okay so it's rating patriarchy chapter uh, page 67 it says, how do we accommodate the men we might love within our family, relationships, or communities while also holding space for critique? How does Kendall model this through her discussion of her family? What are some of the systematic, systemic, or historical factors that Kendall identifies as contributing to hypermasculinity within Black communities specifically? How has hypermasculinity and patriarchy within Black communities created particular expectations or defensive values for Black women? And she notes that, you know, she's looking at page 74 to 75 for this. How does Kendall write toxic masculinity and its harm as impacting LGBTQI youth? I have the audiobook and it's so funny because she does say LGBTQIA youth. The inheritance of colonialist patriarchy has meant that many communities struggle to recover the good and traditional characteristics of their culture's attitude around gender. The absence of pre-colonial knowledge that recognizes the spectrum of gender can do as much harm as culture enforcing norms on those for whom they do not fit. How does the inheritance of patriarchy show up in our everyday encounters, if at all, and how do we refuse that inheritance? Um, I thought it was really pressing that she discusses the need, the understanding that you can love someone, but, and we do need to be thoughtful about how we critique them because it's not that we, and Dr. Cooper discusses this in the author chat that we did with her, uh, where she's, you know, I, I forget what question I asked her, but she responded that, you know, we, like, when she's at a family gathering, she does think through, okay, who is this person? And, you know, is it really productive for me to sit them and read them their rights and give them this whole academic spiel about why what they said was ignorant? Or is there a better way to, like, net education and growth that's not, like, I always have to, like, talk down to you or talk to you as if I have all the answers and you're always wrong? And there are different ways in which we will have to navigate the men in our lives I mean and this is something that kind of came up for me when I explored dating a nigga uh oh they're picking up my trash um you know I remember thinking through like okay this guy that I was seeing he wasn't necessarily I was like uh I don't know how divested he really is from patriarchy and how do I want to counsel him on this right 
Like, I don't think he's as invested in it as the average person, but I still think there is some patriarchy that he needs to let go of. And how much of this is my labor to take on? How can I do this in a loving and caring manner? And where, how does this impact and fit in with my politics? And as Joy is saying, a lot of it is watching the language you use and where, the, and where does a thought of it stem from? Yes. Mm. What are some of the systemic or historical factors that Kendall identifies as contributing to hypermasculinity within Black communities specifically? Should we come back to this chapter? Have enough people read it? Because I think people are just getting their books. So... Oh, I really did like that passage where she talked about, you know, somebody being single or a single mother is not a sign of their failure in life. Hmm. Uh, I think I'm actually. Nikki Kendall said she had just to create a crisp boundary with her grandfather and leave it at that respectfully. I mean, there is loving people where they're at, you know, <laughs> some folks are old and you can kind of get them to be more considerate of certain things, but you might not be able to get them to change. I mean, I, I, I think she also addresses why domestic violence tends to happen at the high rates it does in the black community, especially because one of the, I mean, I think patriarchy for black women is very intimately felt because one of the few places black men can assert their power, which is largely denied from them in the public space, is within their household. Absolutely. All right, I'm actually, though, going to put a pin in it here because I don't know that enough people have gotten to this point in the book and this has gone a little long anyway so we can wrap this up so it's watchable for other folks and come back to this next next week please um look out for a newsletter where I will send out a date once we confer with the the book club to come back and discuss this because I know some people have finished the book I know some people have read further but a lot of folks are just getting their book in the past week and life is hectic for everyone which is why I was 20 minutes late today Look, I understand. I understand intimately. So let's come back to this. Let's start at this point next week. Save all your, your oh, y'all are coming in with the comments right now, but I'm going to let y'all come in next week. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for engaging. I hope y'all are all loving I'm going to tell Instagram to stop emailing me every time somebody logs into the, into the account. Um, thank y'all all for joining. I'm getting all these. Why am I getting messages that y'all commented? This is so odd. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope y'all all have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Don't forget to submit your questions. I will post the form link tomorrow, but it's sent to you in the most recent newsletter. So crack open that newsletter. The link is right at the top because we made a mistake um, in the previous newsletter because the form wasn't open yet. And submit your questions. You know, if you it doesn't, they do not need to be positive questions. Just I do I do want to say you are allowed to have a critique of the book. You are allowed if there is something you did not understand to ask for further explanation. This is all about engaging and it's not about having a crowd of people that loves everything we read. Okay? Okay? Have a good night. I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.